I was uh, I was actually in SFO just a couple weeks ago, and I was or actually last month, and I was it was there on Super Bowl Sunday, and on Super Bowl Sunday, I was sitting next to these two guys in SFO Airport, and they were um, <laughs> and they were from London, and they were amazing, and they were businessmen, and one of them went to church. We knew that because any conversation you have with a stranger always ends up at what do you do, and which is always a weird question because I'm like. Well, it's not very typical. I lead worship. I preach. I travel the world. Me and my wife and my family, we preach that uh, marriage is revival and that the centerpiece of culture is re- is marriage and family. And if we can do that well and we can do that right, then uh, then we know that we can transform the planet Earth. And it's been like that since creation. And the guy's like, oh, that's crazy. The one guy was like, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. The other guy is like, I go to some churches. Have you been to these churches? And I was like, oh, I've been to those churches. That's rad. I said, I've seen these miracles at those churches. Here's some miracles. Here's some things I've seen. And I'm telling him signs and wonders, miracles, stuff we've seen over in Europe, over in UK, over in London. The other guy's kind of like, yeah, whatever. I'm not really interested. And, um, and the one guy's like, dude, that's amazing. And I said, well, let me give you context for this. My, my daughter doesn't walk. She has cerebral palsy. She was diagnosed at 15 months. And immediately, this dude, this dude who was an atheist, immediately emotion, right? He's like, see, if there was a God, he is horrible. He's mean, poverty, war, famine. He said, that's why I don't worship God. And I was like, dude, that's awesome. I said, and because I said, man, now we finally have some emotion from you, you know? And I said, can we start with macro? I said, let me start big and then we'll go back to my daughter. And he said, okay, fine. I said, you're a businessman. You run a really large business over in in London. I said, is there enough money to take care of every person on planet Earth? And he said, yep. I said, okay. Is there enough food on planet Earth for everybody to get three square meals a day with enough calories to sustain their life and be healthy? He said, yep. Then I said, then whose fault is it? He starts crying. And he goes, it's ours. And I said, nope, not personal enough. It's your fault. I said, it's your fault. Take responsibility. I said, because what you did was you switched the source of hurt and the source of hope. And you've lost all your ability to love. Because God is not the source of hurt. He's the source of hope. And people, broken people, are the source of hurt. Right? Hurt people hurt people. Amen? That's just what we do. Even the best of us hurt people. Can you just, we can just admit that together, right? So now he's crying because I said, it's your job. Take responsibility. Those kids starving in Africa that you don't want to take responsibility for, that you want to complain about, that's your fault. Because you have money, I have money, and you haven't done anything, I have. Now here's the crazy part. Most Christians would take that as moral superiority and then try to preach the gospel. You're actually, your authority doesn't come from your moral superiority. It comes from the blood of Jesus. Not because you're a better person than someone else. That's called moral superiority. And we have a moral superiority complex in the church thinking that that's what gives us the authority. No, your goodness is not what gives you authority. His goodness is. So I, so I tell him this and I said, okay, now let's go back to my daughter. I said, we solved the macro problem. It's your fault. <laughs> I said, now let's go back to the micro. I have a daughter with cerebral palsy and you just heard about all the miracles that I've seen. Cancer falling off bodies, broken bones being mended in a moment, blind eyes opening, deaf ears opening, mute speaking. And I said, here's the crazy part. I said, I planted a church in Southern California in 1998. I got fired from that church the mo- when my daughter was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. I chased a God that was bigger than anybody told me. That got me fired from that church. That got me, because of her legs, I followed a God that led me to a house of prayer where I did house of prayer for three years almost two of those years 24-7 from that place a group called Jesus Culture heard my music took my music and put me out with them and we traveled with them for four years traveled all over the world for four years with Jesus Culture that led us into an influential ministry and relationships with people all over the planet where I was traveling all over the world connected to a little girl's legs who did not work who still do not work still do not work that led me to an airport to a delayed flight inside of SFO where the only seat were in this wine bar 
sitting next to you two who came up after us, which means God sent you to me. And so I could listen, so I could tell you about a God you've never heard in a way that you've never heard ever preached to you before so that your life and your heart might turn. And it all began with a little girl's legs not working. Now, let me make this very clear. I said, now, here's the craziest part. Do you honestly think that when my daughter in her fully redeemed body walks right up to Jesus, which is what she's going to do, walk right up to Jesus, she's going to walk right up to Jesus, see all the people her life is affected because her legs didn't work, look in the fiery eyes of Jesus, and say it's not worth it I said sir I hate to break it to you my daughter is going to look at Jesus and look at your life and say he was worth it Jesus because you are worth it I say all that because it's just beyond the breaking see some of you are so afraid to have a breakdown you're like I'm going to have a nervous if I go there I don't know if I can get back and I'm like, then don't come back. Go to the ugly place. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to walk into the fire before God showed up. Do you guys know that, he, that God knew he was going to rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before they walked into the fire? So why didn't he save them on step one? See, some of us are standing in front of the fiery furnace of our life. The fear, the guilt, the shame, whatever it is, we're staring at it and we're refusing to walk in because we're demanding Jesus come out and get us instead of us going into the fire and getting him. It's time for us to walk in in full. That's faith. That's real faith. And so this is what, this is what we've been doing as a family. So <laughs> this is the last night of three weeks of traveling. We've been in. We've been in nine states, 15 churches, traveled 4,000 miles to land us back at the church where my entire journey began. 